Good morning. Welcome, welcome each and every one of you this morning to our worship today at Georgia Plain Baptist Church. Only uh, two more Sundays, including this one, before Sunday school starts. I know that uh, I think all of the children and youth have started school already this past week, but um, we're still waiting for the, the Sunday school year in a couple weeks to start. Um, but welcome, this beautiful, cool day. I'd like to read a, a special welcome uh, that I didn't write, but that really, really speaks to me as we come, as we gather together in the name of Jesus. I want you to hear these words to you personally this morning. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, the friend of sinners. Welcome. Welcome in Jesus' name. Now I invite you to stand if you're able and let's worship God together in song. We'll start with the song, O Come Let Us Adore Him, Christmas in August. And... Um, just come and adore Jesus. Focus your hearts on the Lord. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. We'll praise His name forever. We'll praise His name forever. We'll praise His name forever, Christ the Lord. Sing, you are my all in all. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, my cross my shame rising again I bless your name you are my all in 
Because he is the one on whom all our sins were, were, were piled up, the, the perfect sacrifice to, to take away our sins. So I just want to remind you this morning and reassure you this morning that if you trust in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And nothing stands between God and you. Because Jesus, the Lamb of God, shed His blood and took your sins on Himself. Um, that's the hope of the gospel that we have for forgiveness. This is a song about God's mercy to forgive and save us. His mercy is more. What love could remember? Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the
God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. I, I kind of, uh, yeah, hold that thought, hold that note for when we transition to prayer in a moment. For now, we want to um, acknowledge some birthdays and dismiss the children for children's activity time. So are there any birthdays? I know there are a few birthdays this week. And one today. Any others for today? And then I am Jimmy Knox. What cause was the first song? Are you skipping this year? Okay, the kids ages uh, three through second grade can be dismissed now for the uh, children's time. And thank you, Robin and the adult helpers who are who are helping with this today. As they go downstairs, I just want to share a few announcements. Um, first of all, just to remind you again that Sunday school starts on the 12th of September. Stay tuned for um, more of the specific logistics about that, like where the classes will be and, and who will be the teachers. Um, but also just know that on the 12th, worship begins at 10.30. 10.30, not 9.30 and not 10.15 like we did during COVID, but 10.30 is when our worship service will start, starting September 12th. Um, on the same day, September 12th, please uh, consider coming to the membership luncheon from 12 to 3, especially if you are someone who has recently become a member of the church, or if you're someone who's considering membership or just want to know more what that means. Um, you're not committed to anything by coming. It's an informative time, a, a learning time. Um, and if anyone, uh, you know, is a longtime member and just wants to know more about what membership means, uh, please, please come to this. And just RSVP by next Sunday so we can have a head count for the food. Um, I'm going to stop the announcements there unless anyone has another important announcement to share. Going once, going, yes, Betty. Great. Yes, thank you. So quilting books from Betty on the back pew, back bench and there's still some plates from the cake auction and someone there's a cooler a red white and blue cooler in the Jimmy Center that someone loaned us for the cake auction so um, grab that okay let's um, come to a time of prayer now good morning we're going to start prayer this morning with a prayer of confession and um, is, I know that, I, is that on the PowerPoint? Wonderful. All right, let's pray together. Gracious God, we confess that we have longed too much for the comforts of this world. We have loved the gifts more than the giver. In your mercy, help us to see all the things we pine for are shadows, but you are substance, that they are quicksands, but you are mountain, that they are shifting, but you are anchor. We plead your forgiveness on the merits of Jesus Christ. Accept his worthiness for our unworthiness, his sinlessness for our transgressions, 
his fullness for our emptiness, his glory for our shame, his righteousness for our dead works, his death for our life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord, that our sins, they are many, your mercy is more. This morning we remember your compassion toward us. We remember your gentleness, your care, that you know what it's like to be human and to be tempted, that you know um, and have lived a, a human life in a human body, and, and you also died a human death, and you did that out of your love for us. Thank you, Emmanuel, God with us. And we come uh, remembering those who are suffering this morning. We think of those in the path of Hurricane Ida. Um, and especially just think of those people, the people in New Orleans and, and Louisiana who remember this day um, in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina and all the, the trauma and pain that that carries for them and then again on this day they're facing a hurricane. We do pray that your protection would be known to them in very tangible ways, that neighbor, help neighbor, that um, evacuee would help evacuee, that um, you would care for police and emergency workers of all kinds who are um, laboring and serving and, and risking their lives and protect them. Lord, there are so many, um, and we also just pray for your, your protection that you might lessen the impact of this storm and um, that people would have what they need. We also think of uh, Afghanistan this morning. We think especially of um, the families of those 13 service members who were killed this week in the attack in Kabul. Lord, you know each, each name of each person who has shed a tear um, and, and carries this loss with them and comfort them as only you can, the children, the mothers, the fathers, the spouses, the friends, the other um, service members who were close to these people, as well, we also think of, oh, and we just, we just thank you, Lord, for the service that um, these troops and, and others have given in Afghanistan and in our country and around the world. We also think of the Afghan, Afghanis who were killed in that attack and all those who mourn them. Lord, would you, would you care for them and, and just for this nation and the people who are are suffering and, and living in such fear of what what rule by the Taliban will look like. Um, I think especially of the women, Lord, who have, have known some freedoms uh, over the last decades that, that you intended them to have. Lord, we pray for the women in this place. Um, we ask for justice for them and we ask for protection for them and we pray that those, we, we pray that you would do what you are so good at doing, show up in the midst of, of this chaos and turmoil. And we think of the Afghan refugees who are fleeing Afghanistan and coming um, to the U.S. or other nations. Would you bring them traveling mercies and let strangers show them kindness let um, let them have food and shelter care for the the parents the children the grandparents and elders everyone at whatever stage of life in whatever way they are um, evacuating and leaving would you meet their needs and we also because you tell us to pray 
for our enemies. We pray for the Taliban. We pray for the people in leadership there and um, ask that you would turn their hearts toward Jesus, that they would dream dreams, that they would see visions, that they would uh, be humbled and and turn from from ways of oppression towards ways of justice and peace. And we pray for justice as well for, for these people in Afghanistan. We thank we think of those who um, closer to, to home who are suffering um, with physical needs or, or other um, mental health needs, um, maybe financial needs, and just want to invite you in this moment, if there's someone on your heart um, who is suffering, you'd like to share their name aloud or, or pray silently for them. Let's take a moment to do so. Amanda. Chelsea, Renee. You are the one who knows our name, Lord, and you know you know who each of these people are and their situation and their suffering is known fully to you. Would you meet them in, in this place and show them the depths of your love for them? We also pray this morning for those who need wisdom with decisions. I think of Jasmine and her brothers as they um, take care of, of their mom. Think of college students who are maybe going to college for the first time or returning to college. Would you guide them in this time of transition? Meet them in their uh, loneliness. If it's lonely, meet them in um, whatever situation they're facing. We also think of all those in our church uh, who are caring for others. We pray for um, you, the great caregiver, to sustain each one here who is caring for someone else. And thank you that we can cast our cares on who cares for us, Lord. So whatever cares we come with this morning, if they're financial concerns, if they're um, the, the, the stress that comes from a full schedule and, and return to, um, to school and, and um, kids' activities and our own activities, adult activities, or if it's the, um, maybe sometimes the burden of loneliness and, and um, wanting deeper connection and not knowing how how to find it. If it's a, a, a burden of a situation we just can't figure out or change, or, or maybe even things in ourselves that we, we so want to be different, or our families that we don't feel um, able to, to change. We come with whatever needs that we have, and we cast them on you kind of like a fisherman casting out a line, Lord, we just send them to you, knowing that you are able to receive and hold all that that is weighty for us and all that's important. Thank you that that's who you are. We love you. And let all of our lives bring you praise today and as we go from this place. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Oh, then let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, thank you. I probably won't need it. But. Proverbs 11, verse 28. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Proverbs 28, verse 20. A faithful person will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. Proverbs 13, uh, verse 11. Dishonest money dwindles away. But whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Proverbs 11, verse 25. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Proverbs 22, verse 9. The generous will themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. Proverbs 19, verse 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. Proverbs 18, verse 11. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine a wall too high to scale. Proverbs 11, verse 4. Wealth is worthless in the, in the day of wrath but righteousness delivers from death. This is God's word. Thank you, Marilyn. If you didn't get the memo from that scripture reading, we're talking about everyone's favorite topic today to talk about in church, which is money. Money, money, money. Um, and we're doing this because Proverbs has a lot to teach us about money. The Bible has a lot to teach us about money. Jesus, did you know that Jesus talked more about money than any other subject in the Gospels? So it's a really central part of our Christian discipleship. Um, but I know that it's a sensitive issue for, for a lot, all, all of us, a lot of us in many ways. And so as we start, I just wanted to take a short poll that you can answer with a show of hands, just so everyone knows we're not alone in some of these things. So by a show of hands, how many of you have ever been stressed or anxious about money? I'm surprised not everyone raised their hand. How about this one? How... Many of you have ever wished you had more money? Sarah's hand shot up on that one. How many of you ever feel guilty about how you spend your money? Hmm? Now here's a few questions you don't have to raise your hand for. I wonder how many of you fight about money with your spouse or a family member? How many of you are burdened with debt? How many of you spend more than you make? No hands on that one. Don't. Um, I just want to, as we approach this topic, acknowledge that it's a difficult topic and it's a big part of our lives. And it affects our lives in many different ways. Now, as I read through what Proverbs says about money this week, I was 
um, overwhelmed by how much it had to say. Over 100 verses in Proverbs touch on the subject of money in some way, how to, how to earn it, how to handle it, how to share it, economic systems and structures, the benefits of wealth and poverty, all kinds of subjects. And I thought, I, I can't cover all that in one sermon. So I whittled it down to about 25 verses, 25 Proverbs that I thought would speak to us the most. And I looked at my paper and thought, that's too much. We can't do that. And so I thought, what is the one thing that we most need to hear right now about money? What's the one thing? And what I came up with is very simple. It's this. Do not trust in money. That's what I want you to get from this sermon today. Do not trust in money. Proverbs 11.28 says this. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. This proverb contains these contrasting pictures of like this crumbling sandcastle of trusting in money versus the strong, rooted, thriving life of trusting in God. You see the picture on the screen our, our currency in the U.S. says, in God we trust on it, which I find to be somewhat ironic because this is probably the one thing that keeps us from trusting God the most is money. Even, whether you have a lot of money or whether you're scraping by, it can be so easy to trust in money, to think that it will make you happy or to think that it will protect you from something that you fear. And maybe the reason we're stressed about it and we fight about it and we spend more than we have and we um, worry about it is because we're trusting in it. We're trusting in it to give us something that actually God wants to give us that we think money can give us. So, so don't trust in money. Now money itself is neither good nor evil. In fact, in the hands of a faithful person, money can be a great gift. When we follow Jesus, money can be a helpful thing. But it can so easily turn back and become this godlike power in our lives. Money is a good servant, but a wicked master. So don't trust in money. And, and this morning, as we work through some of these Proverbs, I have... I have two diagnostic questions for you to kind of gauge how much or whether you trust in money. And I ask you as we go through this message to just open your heart and let God um, show you what's there. Be honest with him about your relationship with money, about the good and the bad. Um, because we need Jesus to help us. We all need Jesus to help us to trust in him and not in money. So um, here's the first diagnostic question. How do you feel about getting money? I, I tried to word that very carefully because it's about how we feel about getting money because it's a heart issue. Money is a heart issue. Now, in the book of Proverbs, there are two basic approaches to getting money. Um, Proverbs 28, verse 20, shows us these two approaches. It says, A faithful person will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. So, the faithful person is the one who lives his life, does his work, uses the, the skills God has given him and sees his earnings as a gift from God through which God is providing for him or her. And when I thought about you this week, I know so many of you are doing this very thing and I want to commend you for it. So many of you go to work each day to teach math or assist elders or manage inventory or take care of patients 
or to do medical research or sell insurance or whatever it is, and you earn a living from this work. Some of you um, stay home so that your spouse can earn for the family. Many of you are living on retirement savings or social security that you worked to earn and are now reaping the benefits from that. And I want to just say this is good. Don't ever feel guilty about earning money, about the money God has provided for you. Enjoy what you have as God's provision. But, but here's the distinction. It says, one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. The other way of getting money is thinking about how can I get more? How can I get more? What side hustle can I do to, to build my bank account? How can I get a promotion? How can I get a raise? What stock should I invest in? What's the, you know, what's the Netflix of 2012 right now that I can invest in and cash in big, cash out big? Those who are eager to get rich run into trouble. And do you know why that often is? Because if your income suddenly exceeds your character, you're in trouble. If you have more money than wisdom to know what to do with it, you will waste it. It will lead you into trouble, into to, to bad stuff. Look at Proverbs 13, verse 11. It says, Dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. That phrase, dishonest money, um, literally means money out of thin air. So whether it's like a, a gambling jackpot or some get-rich-quick scheme, basically something that you didn't earn, but you just were like, you came upon perhaps um, dishonestly. What happens when people get suddenly rich is that they... Um, uh, the money just dwindles away. Instead, it's wise to earn money little by little, week after week, dollar after dollar, not focused on the money, but on the work you're doing. Now, what if you still feel like, but I wish I had more? <laughs> I'm not content with what I'm earning. I wish I just had a little bit more. If only I had more money, then I could fill in the blank. Then I could send my kids to that better school. Then I could take that vacation that I so desperately need. Then I would be able to sleep better at night. Then I could have a nicer car and feel better about myself. Right? If only, if only. If you ever have thoughts like that, as I know I do, that means you're trusting in money to give you something that you don't have or you feel you don't have. You're imagining that money can do something for you that actually it can't. Right? And those feelings, if only I had more, can lead you to live as if you did have more. Right? How easy it is to get that line of credit. How easy it is to sign on 2.5% for that new vehicle, even if you don't really have the money for it. And soon you find out that the thing you were trusting in to make you happy is actually swallowing you whole, burying you alive. Debt. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. That's a pretty accurate assessment of um, what happens out there in the world. Many people today do live in a kind of slavery to banks and credit card companies because often, I know the causes of debt are complex, but often it's because people want more. We want more money than we have. I stopped at the grocery store in Burlington this week and in the back row of the parking lot was something that immediately got my attention. There was this um, luxury RV towing a 15 to 20 foot trailer 
And on that trailer were two, you know, probably $10,000 mountain bikes, two kayaks, a bunch of large coolers, and then taking up the majority of the trailer was, I kid you not, a single-seater helicopter. <laughs> because... A few Proverbs that, that talk about this. Proverbs 11:25, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Proverbs 22, 9. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Proverbs 19:17, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for what they have done. Hmm. This is counterintuitive, isn't it? That the more you give, the more you prosper. And we have to be careful here. Beware of those prosperity gospel preachers who say, they turn this into kind of a divine formula. If you give my ministry $100 today, God will return it to you in tenfold. Right? Or if you... If you give away a certain amount of money, God's going to bless you with a better car and a better home. There are people who actually preach that, and you need to stay away from them, honestly. Um, but the truth is that 
generosity gives us richer, fuller, better lives. Social uh, research verifies this. If you just do a quick Google search of the science of generosity, you will find all kinds of results about the power of generosity to actually um, bless the giver. So here's one example from the Templeton Foundation. It says, One survey of 632 Americans found that spending money on other people was associated with significantly greater happiness, regardless of income. Conversely, there was no association between spending on oneself and happiness. Isn't that interesting? Spending on other people makes you happy. Spending on yourself doesn't. And most of you, I think, know this from experience. This is a church, I am grateful to say, of generous givers. I know that, but not because I know what anyone gives. I don't. But I do know that um, our giving was up during COVID. I know that um, whenever there's a financial need in the church, people are there sharing. I know that um, uh, whenever there's a missionary or someone visiting, you guys give to them because you're generous. And you know from experience, those of you who are generous givers, that it brings you joy to give. It brings you joy. Now, how much should you give? It becomes a little more focused here. It's easy to talk about giving in general, but let's put, some, let's put a fine point on it here. How much does God want us to give? How much should we give? Well, in the Old Testament, the, the rule, the law, was a tithe, that each family should bring a tenth, a tithe, a tenth, of what they earned or what they grew and offer it to the Lord at the temple for, for the Lord's work. That would be used to help the poor, to um, s- provide for the priests and Levites, and to provide for the temple structure itself. And we find Jesus in the Gospels talking about this tithing practice that the Pharisees did very exactly down to their garden herbs. But Jesus said, You should be focused on the weightier matters of the law, as in tithing is not some heroic act. It's like a bare minimum for our discipleship. So, and we see in the New Testament, Christians are urged to be as generous as they possibly can be. So, for some of you, 10% might be a very sacrificial um, amount to give of your income. But for some of you, I know that you can give a lot more. And perhaps you already do. Don't wait and see how much is left over in your budget. Like, okay, I've got all my wants and needs taken care of, and now how much do I have to to give? Giving should be the first thing in our budget, the first line item. The first and best of what we earn should go toward the, to the Lord. Give to the church. Give to missionaries, to the work of Christ. Give to the poor. Give to each other. Give to strangers. Just give, give, give. Give your money away and you will be blessed in doing that. I mean, wise people know that giving is, is actually a better more fulfilling way to live. Now, how does, it, how does that make you feel? How do you feel about giving money away? Maybe there's some resistance because it's like, I earned this with my hard work and I deserve it. Or maybe it's hard to think about giving too much because money makes you feel safe. It's easier to sleep at night when you have money in the bank and the retirement savings growing and a car that works well and health insurance that's there for you, right? One reason it can be hard to give money away is because we feel that money makes us safe. But Proverbs speaks to this. Proverbs 18:11 says, "The wealth of the rich 
is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. In the ancient world, if you were rich, you lived in a fortified city, a place with high, thick stone walls around it to keep the bad guys out. That's how you felt safe and secure and could sleep at night. Um, and when we have money to spare, a similar thing happens. We feel that it will protect us, that it will help us, that it will, that it will um, make our lives exempt from the, the hardest things. But that's actually just an illusion. Right? Money is this sand castle that will crumble away. At best, it can be sort of a temporary padding from the difficulties of life, but when it comes to the things that matter, money is not going to protect us at all. I uh, read uh, a quote from an unusual source about this this week. Uh, it was written by Stephen King, of all people, the, the writer of horror novels, who is immensely rich and successful. His books have sold over 350 million copies. Uh, several years ago, Stephen was walking by his home in Maine and he was hit by a van and thrown into the ditch. And he had a profound experience of realizing um, what his wealth can and cannot do. He, s he talked about it in a, a commencement address at Vassar College, and I quote, I found out what you can't take it with you means. I found out while I was lying in the ditch at the side of a country road covered with mud and blood and with the tibia of my right leg poking out of the side of my jeans like a branch of a tree taken down. I had a master card in my wallet, but when you're lying in a ditch with broken glass in your hair, no one accepts master card. We come in naked and broke. We may be dressed up when we go out, but it, we're just as broke. Warren Buffett is going to go out broke. Bill Gates is going out broke. Tom Hanks is going out broke. Steve King, broke, not a crying dime. All the money you earn, all the stocks you buy, all the mutual funds you trade, all of that is mostly smoke and mirrors. So I want you to consider making your life one long gift to others. And why not? All you have is on loan anyway. All that lasts is what you pass on. We have the power to help, the power to change. And why should we refuse? Because we're going to take it with us? Oh, please. If Stephen King can understand that, how much more should we who follow Jesus be generous and not trust in money? Right? Giving money away is the opposite of building that sand castle with money. It's the opposite of trusting in it. Using the gift of money to bless others. And in fact, uh, wealth can't protect us in an even more profound way than Stephen King wrote about. The proverb says, Wealth is worthless on the day of wrath but righteousness delivers from death. Ultimately, what we fear, what we want, is to escape God's judgment. The day of wrath is the day of judgment when there's this final reckoning for all of our lives. And some people imagine that their money, their wealth, can provide them some kind of security against this, but it, it's worthless. It's a sandcastle against a wave. On the other hand, true riches, the riches of knowing Jesus, of being made righteous through him, that's what delivers us from death, from eternal death. And so that's what we should invest in. That's what we should trust in and stake our lives in. If you need help doing this, think about Jesus, who, um, to whom we owe our lives for his generosity. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, <clears throat> For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. Right? So that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus gave up more than anyone has ever given up. He left the praises and the, the splendor of heaven and was born as a nobody and lived as a poor man with no stocks, no savings, no expensive toys, sometimes not even a bed to sleep in. Furthermore, he was killed with the refuse of society outside Jerusalem, the ultimate poor man's death. And why did he do that? Why did he become poor? To make us rich. So that we could share in the true riches that he has. The riches of knowing God, of eternal life, of a life that's rich and full here and now. Right? Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. So don't trust in money. Trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you became poor so that we could become rich with true riches. Help us, God, to not trust in riches that we find here on earth, not to put our stock in the stuff we have or what we earn, things that we feel can, can give us a better life here. We know that money is a gift from you that can help us and provide for us, and yet we don't want to stake our lives on it. We don't want to build our security with it. I pray, God, that you would... Um, perfectly apply the words that I've spoken from your word to each heart here. Some of us are anxious about money. Some of us are proud of what we have. Some of us um, uh, want more money. Some of us are uh, generous. Some of us are not. And I pray that you would unlock exactly what needs to be unlocked in our hearts that we may trust you more fully with our money and be faithful in this area of our lives. May we know the joy of, of generosity, of open-handedness, and of trusting you for the things that matter. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please uh, stand if you're able. We're going to respond in worship as we close our service today with a song that I thought was very appropriate for this message called, My Worth is Not in What I Own. And so um, instead this song says, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul.
Stay for some refreshments if you're able and receive the benediction from Hebrews 13 5 which says keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have for the Lord has said never will I leave you never will I forsake you go in peace